like let's just say hypothetically you're injecting frequently and your total T is 800 total. I would want to see something like if you were to ask me for just like a just like in general, what would, would you want to see as my as my free? I would want to see something like a What happened to your HDL after introducing TRT? That's what, because from what I've seen, the main significant aberrations in biomarkers after the deployment of exogenous tests in general is like, it's not that deleterious to, especially at TRT dosages, you're not going to have some like, you know, crazy, like maybe some, some outliers are going to have potential viscosity issues in their hematology that they need to address through lifestyle changes or whatever. Um, but in general, the thing I see most problematic or difficult to deal with is HDL suppression. And I guess sometimes SHBG suppression can be an issue for some people where they get into like, but usually those individuals are using too high of a dose and infrequent of a dosing schedule, but the HDL just interested if you notice any differences. Yeah. Um, so an answer, and then I also have a question for you. Um, so it's interesting, my, my LDL HDL ratios and my LDL, uh, excuse me, my HDL actually improved, but I attribute that nice. to, um, I attribute that to, I was running, I started running more. So one of the things that I noticed be, before um, starting uh, TRT was that I would train and then it was very hard to train a day or two later. Yeah. I was kind of like bragging and, you know, aches and pains and things, and you still get them, but, but I'm able to train more. So rather than just, uh, you know, just train more in the gym, what I decided to do was it's very, at this point, it's very basic. It's like weight train, take a day off. Um, and on that day off, do some sort of cardiovascular work. I consider the cardiovascular work days off, but yeah. that points to what, how I gym versus running to me, running is one of those things where I feel like the only reason to stop running is because you decide to stop running. Whereas it, the moves, moving physical weight is actually a, a yeah. physics thing as opposed to a neural motivation limited thing. So it's just alternating, you know, lift, run, lift, run, lift, run. And then every once in a while, typically after training legs with weights, I take a day off okay. from everything because I don't, typically want to run the day after I've done that, if I've done it properly. Um, so I, I added more running and was able to recover, which is, that's what I think led to the improvement in HDL. So this is an interesting twist. And I think it's an important one perhaps to mention, which is that yes, TRT can cause some issues with lipid profiles, but if it allows you to do more of the health promoting things that, yeah, are going to support your lipid profiles that can actually feed back to a better situation overall. And that's what happened to me. Likewise, the loss of any appetite for sugar or, or bad foods or processed foods, complete zero appetite for them. So overall, everything improves. In no, that's part incredible. Yeah. Because that's of, great. yeah. So, yeah. So that's how I did, that's how it worked for me. And then that's why I loathe to hear that people start taking TRT or maybe even abusing these things. And then they, use that as an excuse to be looser with their training and their diet, then, then of course they're going to get sicker, right? Yeah. It's just, it stands to reason, you know, it's, yeah. Um, the question I had though, was um, in your vast experience, because you, you certainly know for yourself and you've seen a lot of data from a lot of folks, what, what is the optimal free T range? I, uh, um, two to 3% of your total. And then your total dictated by, I it kind of depends because some people they're so infrequent with their administration that trough versus peak is so has such a big disparity that they're basically functioning on super physiological territory for like a couple of days. And then they dip down into like this, this down slope where they go from like, I don't know, 1300 all the way down to like 500. And then they take their next shot and they go back up. So they get okay. like super physiological amounts of aromatization, five alpha reduction, but proportionally the like, what would be representative of like healthy endogenous, like androgen balance and like, like SHBG is ultimately the, the regulating protein of what is going to determine like how androgen dominant you are versus like everything else that two to 3% is like generally seen as like you're in the good zone, but that's, that could be arbitrary based on just like, you know, the data it doesn't mean that you have to be there. But if I was to see, like, let's just say hypothetically, you're injecting frequently and your total T is 800 total. I would want to see something like if you were to ask me for just like a, 
just like in general, what would you want to see as my as my free? I would want to see something like a 20 upwards of like at most a 24, 25. And that would be like representative of like endogenous, like well-balanced hormones. Now, sometimes this can be a bit different in individuals because very few individuals are even administering on an every other day basis like you are, which is like considered very frequent by normal person standards. They're doing like once a week or even worse, once every two weeks or something like that. Those individuals in general are going to crash with SHBG so significantly that they end up with like a four or five percent free T relative to their total. And then they end up in that sympathetically driven dominant state, perpetual like heightened androgenic signaling. Because again, that free T is what's like circulating around and like being super psychoactive in your brain, right? So that that sort of thing is what can lead to that kind of like overly anxious, harder to fall asleep. And you actually end up being a little bit more volatile and aggressive, whereas otherwise at a more frequent schedule or lower dosage burden, you might otherwise be totally fine and like non-volatile, that sort of thing. So interesting. That's very useful. I mean, first person to ever put a... Uh... Uh, a, a number around this and to, uh, as a reference point, I realize that it's a flexible re reference point, but that's very helpful. I was just curious, um, something that, get, that, you know, there isn't a lot, I've scoured the literature for a kind of optimal uh, ratio, but- um, hey, What's your total uh, now anyway? Cause if you're at baseline, like 600, 700 with natural, like I'm, you're, did you push up to like 1200 presumably, or like 1000 to 1200 or something? Yeah, so um, I'm waiting to get some uh, uh, new blood work back. But yes, yeah, so when I switched to um, uh, the every third day, it yeah, it went um, yeah, it was it was up in the the twelves, twelve okay. range. Um, oh. So it wasn't you know wasn't on the far far end. But the but then I switched to this every other day regimen, and I'm still waiting to get blood work uh, done based on that. But that but subjectively just feel much better. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the yeah. oh. the kind of like trade off in like nuisance versus like optimizing the regimen. Like, obviously, if you could replicate endogenous like pulsation, that would be great because that would be representative of like what you would naturally do if you had. But no one's gonna pin every single day. But I think every other day is kind of like the disparity and like the benefit to the nuisance of it. It's so minute between every day and every other day that that's kind of like I think the golden spot for people to kind of like try and get the regimen down to is like the frequency getting down to like an every other day schedule using like an insulin pen. So it's like very well tolerated, not creating a lot of scar tissue. It's very like, doesn't feel super invasive because you're not using a one and a half inch harpoon that you'd otherwise need to use if you pinned once a week with a much higher volume of oil. Like that sort of thing I think is like, like it seems, it seems like you're pretty dialed in. I wouldn't be surprised if you see like a 1000 on your next one, you feel like it seems like it's representative of like, mm -hmm. you feel pretty good now. So that's great to hear. Yeah, th th that would be a great place to be. And, and, and as I'm tracking all this, of course, um, uh, because uh, I'm doing this in, in large part to, to eventually, uh, just, you know, reveal all the details of this on numbers and subjectively too, I've taken notes, I'll take mental notes, um, uh, et cetera, just because there's so little information out there on this. I mean, I think, you know, you are one of the major sources of information out there in terms of someone who's, um, you know, thinking about this in a balanced way. Uh, everyone else has to guess. Uh, so, but thanks to you, you know, and a few other rare individuals out there like Kyle, who are, who are talking about um, this in the, in the clinical sense and in the practical sense is there's, there's now a real wealth of information under your umbrella. Just a disclaimer to everyone too. We're not we're not saying that if you take thirty milligrams every other day, you'll end up with a twelve hundred or a one thousand. Because some people might need more, some people might need less. So ultimately, it's like individually dependent too. So this is again the importance of the longitudinal data and getting your own blood work done. But just wanted to put that out there, just in case people didn't don't clue in. But I guess I'm well, getting... yeah that they don't cut a clip and then yeah. adjust that statement and then create something. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure that probably happens to you sometimes. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, yeah, from time to time. You know, what's interesting is um, it, uh, but I think in, in general, um, yes, it does happen from time to time. But in general, I think uh, people, uh, it's great to see that people are sharing their experiences with different uh, health tools, good, good and bad. 
you know, when uh, again, you know, like 5% of people or so will experience some serious gastric distress with magnesium of any kind. Well, mm. those people shouldn't take magnesium. The other 95%, it's up to them. So yeah. I, I would say that the best dosage for, for some people is zero milligrams yeah. uh, of anything. And yeah. uh, zero is a valid number to take um, yeah. for some people. That's, yeah. that's important too. I appreciate you staying on with me until uh, 10, 15. Like I know for me, this isn't bedtime, but for you, it's like pretty damn close. So I appreciate you taking the time Thanks. to help uh, educate and put out high quality information and uh, create hopefully some high quality entertainment for people simultaneously. And um, I've been looking forward to this for a while. I'm glad to finally have you on here. And um, if you want to plug any of your social medias, is it Huberman Lab on all the platforms or... Yeah, okay. Huberman Lab on Instagram, Huberman Lab on Twitter. Um, it's mostly Instagram where I'm at. And then Huberman Lab Podcast is Apple, Spotify. We have a YouTube channel um, as well. So it's uh, any of those formats. And um, I also want to thank you. I, I stayed on because I was uh, really enjoying the conversation. As I, I, I know I've said it a, a number of times throughout, but I think that to be able to access quality information and to really, for people to also learn some biology, they're learning from you about hormone pathways and thinking about how these things interact. It's really wonderful. I look forward to uh, hopefully more conversations on and offline with you and to discuss uh, the papers that we're pulling up. I think what we've established a sort of informal journal club of sorts. For those that don't know, journal clubs are where people interested in a common topic will start to review papers and think about those papers and discuss them. And I, I just really, um, I really want to extend my a genuine thanks that because I think that um, it's rare to get the opportunity to drill really deep into all these topics um, yeah. and to also get a chance to 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 learn back and forth about um, you know what people are doing, what they should avoid doing. And uh, it's just really terrific that you've created a, a platform for this. So thank you, Derek. No, I appreciate that, man. So everyone go follow Andrew on his uh, platforms and as well, watch out for a exclusive episode in the somewhat near future with our medical director at Merrick Health. He's going to be featured on Andrew's podcast and deep diving even more into endocrinology and hormone optimization and whatnot. So watch out for that and make sure you like the video, subscribe and uh, catch you guys next time.